And our sermon title this morning is A Time to Sow and Reap. A Time to Sow and Reap. And this is part two in our sermon series as we work through John chapter 4, verses 27 through 42. In John chapter 4, we saw at the beginning of this chapter in verses 1 through 26, an example here with the Lord Jesus Christ and the woman at the well, an example of the Lord evangelizing. He evangelizes this woman at the well, shares the gospel with her. We saw how the Lord did that. And now here, beginning in verse 27, as we began last week, we see those truths that we learned in verses 1 through 26 now expanded. And there are lessons for us to learn about this. Uh, and these are glorious lessons, and we need to take these lessons to heart. Beginning in verse 27 last week, we first saw the glorious provision that the Lord makes for his people to be involved in this work. It is not a light thing to say that wicked sinners like you and I, now because of the grace and mercy of God, get to participate in the work that God does to redeem a sinner. That is a glorious blessing. Uh, it, it, it can't be lost on us that former liars, former fornicators, former adulterers, rebels, enemies in their mind by their wicked works, former lost wicked sinners like you and I get to be involved in the work of evangelism. And if you don't see that as a grace, you don't see that as a blessing, you don't see that as a joy, then I would submit to you there's a problem in your heart that you need to do business before God with to fix. It is a heart problem. This is a blessing. And it's a joyous work that we do. Joyous blessing to see a lost sinner saved by God. Uh, it's a glorious blessing. Now, we've seen our share of that around here. Amen? That is a great blessing of God here in our church, and it gives us great joy. More joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, right? We share, as a little outpost of heaven here, we share that joy here when someone gets saved. This is a glorious provision of God's work. He says in verse 27, At this point his disciples came. They marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, What do you seek? Or what are you, why are you talking with her? So the woman then left her water pot. She went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came to see him. We see in verses 1 through 26 the example of our Lord witnessing to her. And in that example, we know that ultimately it is God who saves, right? Jonah chapter 2 verse 9 says that salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. But God here doesn't operate apart from the means of the Lord Jesus Christ witnessing to her. He uses the Lord witnessing to the woman at the well to save her. And in that, we're reminded that although God is sovereign, we are responsible. And God uses the means of his people to accomplish his work. So when you signed on to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you turn from your sin, put your faith in him, then you have signed up for employment with the Lord to do his work. And we see that exemplified perfectly here by the Lord Jesus Christ. Additionally now, from 27 to, to verse 30, we see the disciples and their work that they're about to enter into. Think about this. Because God has chosen in his wisdom to use the means of his people to save others, he involves us and provides opportunity for us to be involved in this work of sowing and reaping that we see here. We saw last week how his disciples here were being prepared for that work by the Lord's example. And there are lessons there that they're learning. In verse 28, we see the woman, right? A brand new disciple, fresh out of the oven, already going off into the city to do the work that the Lord has given her to do. God is sovereign over salvation, but makes glorious provision for his people to be involved. In fact, he makes it the mission of his people. And it's always been that way. It's been the mission of God's people in the Old Testament. It is the mission of God's people in the New Testament. And it is a tremendous blessing. What a tremendous grace right? What a tremendous grace. In fact, we often around here refer to evangelism as a means of grace to God's people. Now think about it for a moment. It is certainly a means of God's grace to that person that he's going to save as a result of that evangelistic encounter, right? Certainly a means of grace to that person who's going to be saved. But what about the person evangelizing? Listen, it's a means of grace to you too. Um, think about it. If you are faithful in this work of reaping, of sowing and reaping in the Lord's harvest field, then it is rocket fuel to your Christian growth, isn't it? 
If you've been faithful in that work, you know how the Lord has grown you through that work. It leads to growth in God's word. You've got to study. You've got to answer objections. You've got to know what the Bible says. You need to know how to faithfully and accurately and articulately and compellingly give the gospel message. You're going to be in God's word, and when you're in God's word, you're going to grow. It leads you to pray, doesn't it, for the person that you're witnessing to. How many of you, genuine Christians in this room, have shed tears, lost sleep, praying over that lost family member, that lost coworker, that lost child that you want to see saved, right? Causes you to pray. And the Lord grows you in your communion with him through prayer. That's a grace, a grace that comes from the Lord through the means of evangelism. It causes you to put to death that sinful fear of man. And when I first witnessed to a, a stranger, there was knee-knocking fear involved. But by the Lord's grace, you be faithful to the Lord in that work, and the Lord helps you overcome, put to death that sinful fear of man. Convicts you of your hypocrisy. How can you stand there talking to a stranger about their sin when you're in your own, right? So it convicts you of hypocrisy, teaches you how to put off that sinful flesh, put away your sin, repent. You learn apologetics. You learn apologetics. It gives you a backbone of steel, doesn't it? A forehead of flint because you've got to answer those objections. You've got to answer those sometimes hostile questions. But most of all, most of all, in proclaiming the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you ascribe praise and glory and honor to him, the Lord of glory. It is a precious and blessed privilege of God's people. And you're going to be blessed by God in that work if you're faithful to do it. So in verse 28 now, in verse 28, after her stunning encounter with the God-man, right? After her stunning encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, who told her everything she's ever done, the woman, now the woman at the well, uh, leaves as the disciples are just arriving on the scene. And she goes into the village. The disciples are walking up in time to hear that last statement, I who speak to you am, as the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself as the Messiah and reveals his deity. And so in verse 30 now, her witness... Her witness is so compelling that the villagers begin pouring out. That's what that word means there. Pouring out of the city, pouring out of that village to see Christ, to hear him, uh, to hear him speak as the Messiah. They are pouring out of the village of Sychar. Now, meanwhile, as the woman departs, forgets her water pot, leaves that behind, goes off into the village, another conversation now ensues at the well. And this is the Lord's conversation with his disciples. And we see that in verses 31 through 35. And what that is communicating to us there in those four verses, five verses, is now, point two on your notes, the priority of the work. We've seen God's provision of the work for his people. Now we see the priority that that work should be to us, the priority that it should have in our lives. Look at verse 31. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Verse 33, therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now simultaneously in these verses, we see two different perspectives or two different priorities being asserted here at exactly the same time. We see a worldly priority or a worldly perspective and we see the heavenly priorities or the heavenly perspective think about it as you look at verse 31 the disciples thinking in a worldly sense urged jesus to eat in verse 31 so jesus then in hearing them say rabbi eat jesus thinks about the heavenly food that sustains him right the heavenly food that strengthens him the heavenly food that brings him joy and that is as he explains doing the will of the father and finishing his work so as Jesus then mentions the heavenly food that I have, that he has, I have food which you don't know about, the disciples all of a sudden with their worldly perspective think somebody must have brought him a sandwich. And so they're thinking in a worldly sense. Now as Jesus Christ again starts differentiating or showing distinction between the heavenly perspective that we should have, the worldly perspective that here the disciples have, this is a pretty remarkable lesson that Christ is going to teach with the economy of words in just a very short time. Think about this lesson. The most important thing to the Lord Jesus Christ 
that thing which is most important, that thing that would take priority over even his necessary food, would take priority over anything else in his life, is doing the will of the Father and finishing his work. The most important thing to Christ, with a heavenly perspective, is doing the will of the Father and finishing his work. You have to ask yourself then, what is that? What is the will of the Father? What is his work? Here, doing the will of the Father is characterized in large part by evangelism, by witness, by bearing witness, by witnessing to this woman at the well, her witnessing to the Samaritans, his work of seeking and saving that which is lost. Here, this priority exemplified perfectly in the life and work of the Son of God. Everywhere that the Lord Jesus Christ went, he was witnessing, wasn't he? Everywhere that he went, he was involved in the Father's work of sowing and reaping. That was his heart. That was his desire. That was his joy. That was what sustained him. That was what strengthened him. He longed to see lost people saved. Now you think about that for a moment. Jesus Christ put himself in the company of tax collectors and heathens and harlots. For what purpose? To see them saved. To see them, to see them in heaven one day. To save their souls. It was Jesus who in just a few chapters from now showed compassion to a woman who was caught in adultery, right? And he told her, go and sin no more. Saved her. It was Jesus Christ who stood on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem and cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. It's the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ for lost sinners, lost souls, that they would come to faith. We see that same heart. We see that same heart in Paul, right? In Romans chapter 9, listen to this. Paul's statement in Romans chapter 9. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Over what, Paul? Over what? What is the sorrow? What is the burden on your heart? Verse 3, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He wanted to see his countrymen saved. He had a burden, a burden they would come to faith in Christ. Listen to this from David, an Old Testament example. Listen to this from David in Psalm chapter 40. David says, sacrifice God, an offering you did not desire. He says, my ears you have opened. David was a saved man. His ears are open, his eyes are open, his heart has been changed. And look at what he says. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. The will of God the Father was his necessary food. The will of God was sustenance to his soul, strength to his soul. His delight was to do God's will. And listen to David's words in reference to what that will, what that work is. Listen to what he says. He says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, David says, I do not restrain my lips. O oh Lord, you yourself know. If you're a Christian, if you've had your heart changed, if you've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then it's not a matter of, I gotta do this. It's a matter of, I can't restrain my lips. And if, you're restra if you find yourself in that situation of restraining your lips, it's a heart problem. There's sin there that we need to repent of. A Christian has got to speak of Christ. It's a compulsion. Here, we see that in David. I don't restrain my lips, oh Lord, you yourself know. Listen, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. Think about it. If you restrain your lips, you are hiding that treasure. You are hoarding that treasure within your own heart. You got to give that out. Tell someone else about it. Here he says, I've not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness, God, and your salvation. I've not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly can't conceal that glorious blessing. The Lord has given us responsibility to speak, to bear witness. A significant problem, a significant problem with many professing Christians today, and I use that word professing on purpose, is they just don't do it. They just don't do it. 
widespread. The reason that the, the church seems so ineffectual, the professing church seems so ineffectual in the world today is because the church just by and large isn't doing it. God's people, if they have that treasure, are hoarding that treasure to themselves, so to speak. A significant problem is that what many in the professing church would look at, in many of you here, and see overboard zeal is simply a faithful Christian. What the Bible would describe is simply faithful. But right, you know, many of us have gone to churches before we see that one guy, right? That one, the kooky guy over there always talking about Jesus. Listen, that's just faithfulness of the Lord. But he looks out of place because the others aren't. Romans 12 says, this is, listen, this is our reasonable service. Our reasonable service is doing the will of the Father and finishing his work, preaching Christ. Luke chapter 17 says, when we've done all this, we are at best unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Right biblical priorities, okay? Right biblical priorities followed by obedient action from the heart in the power of the Spirit for the glory of God is simply faithfulness to the Lord. Simply faithfulness to the Lord. Right biblical priorities followed by obedient action from the heart in the power of the Spirit for the glory of God is simply faithfulness to the Lord. Now, if you're in the Word of God at all, you know these things intellectually. But so many professing Christians simply don't do them. Simply don't do them. I was reading a book by Colin Marshall. Uh, we're taking our leadership group through it now called The Trellis and the Vine. Called The Trellis and the Vine. And in that book is a quote from a one half of a comedy team called Penn and Teller. It's a quote from there, uh, Penn Jillette. Uh, Penn Jillette is a staunch atheist. And after a show of Penn and Teller one time, a man came up to Penn Jillette and tried to witness to him, to evangelize him after the show. Here's what Penn Jillette said. This is coming from an atheist. Penn Jillette said, I've always said, you know, that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. That means, in our case, sharing the gospel, okay? This atheist said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, well, it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward, he says, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize them? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? He says, I mean, if I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this, he says, is more important than that. Coming from an atheist, sowing and reaping is a priority of God in redemptive history. Sowing and reaping is a priority of God in redemptive history. It was a priority of the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. And now, if you're a disciple of Christ, it is a priority for you and me. It's our priority too. Take a cue from an atheist. We'd have to say that many professing Christians are so disobedient in this work simply because they don't themselves believe. And this work is a crucial part of doing the will of the Father and finishing his work. If they do believe, if they do believe, it just means it's simply not a priority. Not a priority to them. It's neglected. And that points to a significant heart problem. I want you to think about this. Be thankful to God. Praise God. Worship God. Magnify God. Honor God because someone before you, it was a priority for them. Because you came to faith because someone else prioritized getting the gospel out. It was a priority to someone before you. You have a Bible in your hands, in your language, because it was so much a priority to that man that he translated it to his own demise. It cost him his life. He burned at the stake for it. Someone gave their life to get it to you. You are a product of the fact 
that getting the gospel out, this work of sowing and reaping, you are a product of the fact that it was a priority to someone. Make it a priority for you so that for the sake of someone else's soul, they can be saved and for the the glory of God. And make it a priority to you so that Christ receives the full reward for his suffering. Uh, This is important, serious business. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is an eternity. And people are just dropping into hell right now, dying. There's so much work to be done. Jesus here, in that reality, takes an opportunity to teach his disciples a lesson in just these few verses. And it's a lesson that Jesus is teaching about his own priority for sowing and reaping, all of which he summarizes as the will of him who sent me. Jesus said to them in verse 34, my food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He was so heavenly minded that when it came to everything around him, so concerned to seek and to save that which is lost, so filled with delight over doing the will of the Father that food just wasn't that important to him right now. You ever been so excited about something you just forgot to eat? (laughs) Yes. Forgot to go to sleep? You know, you you stay up all night and somehow nine o'clock in the morning rolls around, you're just not tired, (laughs) right? that, That thing which just occupies your excitement, your desire, your will, To him, it was here. It was doing the will of the Father. It was evangelizing the lost, seeking and saving that which is lost. And have you yet, tell me this isn't true, have you yet realized that the more selfish you are, the more self-centered you are, the more self-indulgent you are, the less happy you are, the less joyful you are. Truth, right? Really. The less joyful you are, the less happy you are. There is joy in doing the will of the Father and finishing his work. There's joy in entering into this work. And so you got to think to yourself, what's your water pot? What have you not left behind? The woman at the well came to the well. She's so preoccupied with that conversation. She forgot the original reason she went. She leaves her water pot behind to go into the city to do exactly what the Lord had called her to do. She's been saved to mission. She goes into Sychar to tell the men of that city about the Lord Jesus Christ. And leaving that water pot behind. What's your water pot? What is it that you prioritize over doing the will of the Father and finishing his work? Is it pleasure? Is it leisure? It just those self-indulgent things. Think about it. Whatever that water pot is, leave it behind and get into the harvest field. Work for the Lord. It is a great priority. But Now next, it's a priority because it's so important. It's such an important work to do because we're talking about heaven and hell and eternity. But also, it's an important work because it's an urgent work. We see the priority of the work of sowing and reaping in its urgency. Look at verse 35. Bible says here, "Do Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. Jesus Christ, in verse 35, reminds the disciples of an adage, a proverb, a proverbial statement that went around at that time. That is, there are still four months and then comes the harvest. The idea is, you got a time. You got time, right? We sow, then we got four months to reap. In other words, Don't get yourself in a tizzy. Slow down, right? Take time. These things don't happen immediately. You can be England, you can be France, but don't be Russian, right? Take your time. Here, he makes that statement, gives them the proverbial statement, but then he says this, listen, behold, he's addressing them with great emphasis, great authority, and great urgency. He says, now look, get this, pay attention. Church, pay attention, pay attention. Lift up your eyes. Focus now on what must be your highest priority right now. The fields are already white for the harvest. However you usually view the time that comes between sowing and reaping, you got to put that out of your mind. That's no longer the case. That's not your reality now. You've got to redeem the time because the days are evil. Doing the will of the Father in sowing and reaping has been the Lord's priority. That work is now also going to be on the forefront of the disciples' priorities as well. 
They can't prioritize sowing, you know, some time somewhere and then waiting around and to see what happens. They've got to be involved in the work now. I can't help but imagine in this passage, we don't know for sure, but I can't help but imagine in this passage that as the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to them and he says, behold, lift up your eyes, that he's pointing. And as he's pointing, the disciples lift their eyes and look into the fields around Sychar as the men of the village start pouring out of the village to come hear Christ, he says the fields are already white for the harvest. And in this, this picture that is being portrayed, again, we see the worldly perspective in one case and the heavenly perspective on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ. From a worldly perspective, here come the people of Sychar. Now, it was common for them at that time to wear a woven garment that was knee length or longer that would have been white. It would have looked like white robes. So here, through the fields outside of Sychar, come the Samaritans, dressed in white. The fields are white for the harvest. In the heavenly perspective of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the harvest that we're reaping. This is the work that needs to be done. You disciples entering into my labor, this is the work that I've given you to do. The souls of men, people going to heaven, going to hell. And he just looks up and they, they witness this, this scene of the men of Sychar coming out to hear Jesus Christ preach. These men crossing over ancient boundaries, right? Disregarding ancient grievances for salvation for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think about the arresting use of that word behold, and when you put that into the context of people pouring out of the city at that time, and then the true desire and joy of the Christian in doing the will of the Father, Sowing and reaping would now, at this moment, have to be chief among their priorities. It's got to be a priority. There's another very key word in this passage. It got that key word, behold, and the urgency of it all. But another very key word in this passage that con conveys great urgency is the word already. It's the word already. Do you, say, do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Jesus says, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. This word already communicates urgency. Don't let that ripe fruit rot on the vine. How many of you have had an opportunity presented to you by the Lord to witness to somebody and you didn't? Have you, am I the only one? There's opportunity. There's opportunity Work in the Lord's harvest field. Reap that fruit, the Lord, that opportunity the Lord has given you. They're already white for the harvest. Don't let the fruit rot on the vine. Sowing is no longer only a time when you plant a seed and then wait around. You've got to be about the work. You can't wait. You can't wait to get involved in the work. If you're not involved in the work, if you're not prioritizing, repent of that sin and get involved in the labor. The fields are already white for the harvest. And now, because of the urgency of the work and the priority of the work, sowing, the time in between, and reaping are all now, according to verse 36, just happening simultaneously. He who goes out to sow the seed, sows the seed as the reaper is coming back and they both meet in the middle rejoicing together. It's all happening simultaneously. It's an urgent work. It's also very interesting if you look at the original language, if you look at the Greek, the word already is the very last word of verse 35. Now, back in that day, when these manuscripts were written, you didn't have verses, right? They didn't have verses. The language just ran on, just kept going. So there's no verse division between 35 and 36 in the original language. And already that Greek word is the last word of verse 35. I actually think that it's more appropriate that it looks forward to verse 36. Look at that. Either way, it communicates the same truth. But looking forward to verse 36, and already he who reaps receives wages. Already the one who is reaping is receiving reward, receiving wages for his labor. Already people are pouring into the kingdom. Already a Samaritan of that well got saved. Already the people of the village of Sychar are coming out to hear Jesus Christ. And already Samaritans are going to be saved. Already Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is doing that work of saving the world. Already he who reaps receives wages. The point is, there is no time to waste. And you and I live in this same time. We live in this same time. 
It is a time of sowing and reaping, a time of sowing and reaping. Now that for which the sower sows and that for which the reaper reaps is for a purpose. And that purpose now here is to gather fruit for eternal life. That is, those are the wages for the reaper. That's the fruit of the reaper. That's that which he is reaping for, is to gather fruit for eternal life. That should remind us, now think about that, that should remind us that this is no light work that we undertake. It is a work of eternal significance. They're gathering fruit for eternal life. There will be eternal death or eternal life. Here, the reapers go out to reap for eternal life. It should remind us that it's not a task that we can take late, lightly. And it needs to remind us that it does ultimately matter whether we do it or not. Some people think to themselves about the work of the Lord, and they think in a very unbiblical way, that if, if I don't get it, somebody, if I don't get to it, somebody else will. You know, you get a, you get a, a need comes up. There's a need that comes up, and you think to yourself, eh, other people have this email, other people have seen this. I don't have to do anything. Somebody else is going to get to it. That is sinfully negligent. That's unbiblical thinking. Stinking thinking. Some people think to themselves, well, if, if I don't witness that person, if the Lord wants to save him, the Lord's going to save him. The Lord is sovereign. That is an unbiblical way to think. It is our responsibility. We have responsibility. And the Lord, if the Lord's going to save him, the Lord is going to use the means of his people to do it. And it's not right to think that apart from those means that somehow the Lord's going to do that work and just push, push it back on him. We don't know how that all fits together, how God's sovereignty and man's responsibility at the end of the day work together, but we know that they do because that's what the Bible teaches. You can't pass up opportunities thinking about things that way. This task that we have, this task of sowing and reaping, involves the eternal life of someone. The eternal, the eternal life of someone. It's going to go on forever. We have to have this work as an urgent, high priority work if we are the people of God. It was God's work, it's the Lord's work, it's our work. It has to be a high priority to us. There's a, a prophecy in the book of Amos. Listen to this from Amos chapter 9. Verse 13, he's speaking about all this together. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. Now this is an end times, an eschatological prophecy, but it's a now prophecy too. It's a now and not yet. This is the day that we live in. When the plowman's overtaking the reaper, uh, the treader of grapes is passing by him who sows seed. It's just we're sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping together and Lord's people, God's people are rejoicing in that. So is this a cause then for complaining? Is this a cause for complaining? Look at all this lousy work I gotta do. Now I'm a Christian, I gotta, gotta go share the gospel with somebody. I mean, is it, is it something to begrudge? No. Anyone who is a Christian, a genuine Christian would not feel it. If there's any sense of that in your heart, again, that's something to repent of. Again, it's to, you've got to go to God's word, cry out to the Lord for help, cultivate in yourself a, a desire to see lost people saved and then follow up that desire with action. Someone says, look at all these people I have to deal with now. No, no, this is the harvest field. It's a field in which we should take joy that we get to work in. It's a cause for rejoicing. There are a lot of so-called Christian that would, so-called Christians that would rejoice over the great apostasy coming because they don't have to evangelize. What a, what a wicked attitude. Think in your heart, I don't have to evangelize or I don't want to evangelize. It's a problem in your heart. You know, there's an old joke about pastors. Uh, the pastor who says, you know, work in the ministry would be great if it weren't for all these people. <laughs> that is that is the ministry. Verse 36. He says, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. When biblical desire, 
meets God-provided opportunity and someone is brought out of death to eternal life, listen, that is flat out awesome and we should rejoice over that. Amen? Amen? It's a cause for great rejoicing. So that points us to point three on our notes is the present joy of the work. The present joy of the work. We see that in verses 35 through 38. Look at verse 36. He who reaps receives wages. He who reaps is already receiving wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the saying is true, one sows and other reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, you have entered into their labors. The purpose in verse 36 of sowing and reaping is so that there may be rejoicing together. We rejoice with the Lord. If you start here, in verse 36, 37, 38, start trying to figure out or pin who it is who reaps and who it is who sows, you're missing the point, right? It's going to lead you down a, a rabbit trail. The great joy is the point. Great joy is no matter what part you play in this. Whether you sow, whether you reap, there's great joy in entering into the work. Let's remember that together, right? Because oftentimes folks can get discouraged or disheartened, uh, disappointed when you feel as though you're sowing, 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 sowing like crazy and you're not seeing any fruit. You're sowing, doing the work of the Father, doing the will of the Father. You're sowing in the Lord's harvest field. You just keep sowing. Our responsibility is to be faithful to God. God's in control of the results. There will be many. Many have sown before you. Many have sown before us. And they were not permitted to see the reaping. We live in a day now of sowing and reaping. And if you've been here as a part of this church and you've been faithful in evangelism, you have been reaping and rejoicing with us when someone comes and they're genuinely saved. And usually you, you hear their testimony and they've talked to 14 different brothers and 12 different sisters. And, you know, this person's been a major impact on them. And that person's been a major. And the Lord has used all that to provide the increase but God is the one who provides for the increase. He gets all the glory. Here, the disciples and us, we live in a time of reaping. Think about those that went out before us. Here, those that have gone out before sowing, John the Baptist was one. John the Baptist went out sowing until his head was removed from him, right? Think about the prophets. Certainly the Lord Jesus Christ is out sowing, but think about the prophets before, and Jeremiah, right? The weeping prophet, weeping over the souls of his people. There have been many who have gone out to sow before us. Think about our context and the reformers who went before us. That man that gave his life so that you'd have a translated Bible. Right, those reformers that gave their lives to fight for justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Those great saints of old who sowed before and we now reap a blessing. Those that gave their lives it's true. This is true of, of, verse, of the disciples in verse 38. Jesus says, I sent you to reap that for which you've not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. They had the blessed privilege of being sent out by the Lord into the harvest to reap that for which they have not sown. Reminds me of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now listen. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward. That's interesting. We receive our own reward. We're gonna receive a reward according to our labor. This is the same thing as he who reaps receiving wages. There's a reward here. For the disciples at this point in time, this is the first time they've been put into the work. Here come the men of the city and the disciples are gonna begin sowing and reaping among those men of the city. It's the first time they've been put into the work. And the Lord sends them to reap a harvest among the Samaritans, and they're going to receive a reward for their labor in that. It's an amazing thought. The Lord saves us the best possible reward. The Lord blesses us and all that, seats us in the heavenlies with Christ, adopts us as his son. Think about all these blessings, right? And then the Lord blesses us to be able to participate in the work. He gives us the power of his spirit to do it. We're to do it through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord does literally everything for us. We just have to put our faith in him. And then in doing all that, the Lord then rewards us for doing that for which he saved us, for doing that work that he gave us to do. It's just an amazing thought, isn't it? The Lord just lavishes grace, lavishes grace, lavishes grace. The Lord sends us out too. This is true of you and me. God 
ultimately does the sowing, but we get to enter in and reap, and there is a reward waiting for those that do. Matthew 9, 36 says this, When Jesus Christ saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. So when he saw the multitudes, his heart was moved to compassion. Now, sometimes you got to get out in the field to see the multitudes, to cultivate an understanding of the lostness of this world in which we live, to cultivate in you a compassion. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There is always, it is that statement is as true as it was 2000 years ago, is just as true today. There is so much work to be done. There are so many lost people whom the Lord will save because Matthew 16 says that Jesus is building his church. He's doing that even now. There's so many lost people that the Lord will save. There is too much of a harvest out there right now that we don't have enough laborers to go get it. And we need to pray that the Lord would send out more laborers. You know, I've often thought before, just real simple logic, right? If you could walk out the front door of this church, you knew beyond a shadow of a, shadow of a doubt, you just walk out into that parking lot, there's gonna be a person standing there, you're gonna share the gospel with that person and that person is gonna be gloriously saved, saved right there on the spot. How many of you in this room would reject the notion of going out the door to do that? Just sit in your chair. No, 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 it'd be a fight getting out of here to go talk to that guy if you knew he's gonna be saved. I mean, he's got fresh pickings right there. That's the way it is. The Lord has people, the harvest is plentiful, plentiful. The harvest is out there. It's the laborers that are few. You just gotta go out and share the gospel and you're going to come across them. The Lord has many in this city that he will call to himself. We just have to get out and be faithful in the work. But also, this all leads us to point four on your notes, the eternal fruit of the work. The eternal fruit of the work. That reward, those wages, aren't the only fruit that's produced. There's fruit for eternal life being produced here. Verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with him and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. There were many there who believed because of the faithful witness of this once lost, immoral, scandalous Samaritan woman. But many there believed because of the, grace, the gracious witness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They came to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing they received life eternal. And it's interesting, at the, end of 30, at the end of verse 42, Samaritans, the most unlikely of peoples. And they were saved simply by believing upon him, coming to him in faith. That's a lesson also for us to learn. There is no outcast which the Lord, to bring glory to himself, will not save. There's no rebellion so severe that the Lord cannot
of the work. God, you were so glorious, so gracious, so good, so kind. We praise you and worship you, Lord, that you saved us. Now, Lord, find us faithful to go out with that work. Lord, don't allow us, God, to hoard that treasure, hoard your righteousness within our own hearts, but let us speak of it in the great assembly that you may be glorified, that lost sinners will be redeemed to you, God, and worship and praise you forever. We do this for your glory and for the good of those people, Lord. We just, we enjoy our fellowship so much here, God. Enjoy the peace that you've given us in this little outpost of heaven. And we just want to take many, many, many more with us in the glory. And we, as you, Lord, we know you do from the word, rejoice together in that glorious truth. It's all these things we pray in the blessing of our Savior, the Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ.